Well, it started as so many things do these days with a tweet from Elon Musk. Last Monday, the world's wealthiest man announced his company, Neuralink, had implanted a brain reading device into a human subject. We're going to talk about that and much more with neurologist and healthcare science professor, Dr. Joe Servan. He's here to take your health and healthcare questions as he will the first Monday of each month. First up, Dr. Joe, thank you so much for doing this. And this is such a pleasure to be joining uh, you on Monday mornings. At C- we'll, we'll promote a healthy Monday for the rest of the week. Oh, How's excellent. That? And for the rest of the month. <laughs> so um, faithful listeners will be familiar with your show, What's Health Got to Do With It? That airs every Saturday at, at 4 p.m. Um, one thing that you're going to do for us that you're not able to do on that show is to take calls and take people's questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Joe, you can give us a call at 904-549-2937, or you can email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. You can also message us on Facebook or Instagram or tag us on X at FCC on air. Um, Dr. Joe, talk a little bit about the program that you already do, the What's Health Got to Do With It, for people who may not have heard. Um, it really is wide open in terms of topics. Yeah, and it's a, a show really designed to talk about how do we navigate not just the science of medicine, which we can get in a lot of places, but the healthcare system. Uh, how do you make the system work for you because one thing I've learned over my years of practice, we're there to take care of people. We want to help. Uh, And doctors and nurses and all the other folks are there with all that knowledge to like, you know, write the prescription, do the treatment, do whatever. But what's changed over the years I've done this is that more and more the questions are how do I navigate the system to get the treatment that you just offered me? And I find that's what you spend more time discussing. Uh, what happens when there's a drug shortage? What, do you, what happens when there's no prescription? What about that law they just passed? And so that's what the show tries to help, not is connect the science, the health, but the healthcare system, which has now become the new person in the room with us. It really is, can be very Byzantine for people who are trying to navigate it, find a way, afford it. I don't even know. I think you, that's why they have no degrees uh, to get people to know this is this is the system. This is the this is the people making policy that actually directly impacts your health. The insurance companies, uh, the industry behind it. You almost have to know all that these days, in, especially if you have a chronic, complicated condition. So that's what the show's hoping to to really help uncover week in week out. And so House Calls with Dr. Joe will give us a chance to really connect directly with people who may have those questions. Exactly. And I mean, although, I, and, and this is my warning, I can't practice medicine over the radio, Just, uh, but, but if there's a way to kind of guide or at least say, hey, you know, take a look at this, or did you think of that, that may be something that we can do. So please give us a call if you do have questions, uh, or you can reach out on social media. Um, I do want to talk about this brain implant <laughs> yes. technology because yes. it is just um wild right uh you're that i let's insert whatever synonym for wild but i'll go with wild it it is startling on one level uh in because it's such promise of how far we've come but there's this other part of me that says oh my god (laughs) we've arrived here uh so it's an interesting uh intersection but for those people where this could benefit, uh, this is this is incredible. Yeah, you're a neurologist. This is tapping into specifically that kind of science. So explain to us what this kind of implant can do um, from a neurological standpoint. Well, first, what we can say is that uh, one of the difficulties in talking about this is that the discovery itself is somewhat enshrouded in mystery. We haven't seen the first patient. The trial in which this is being done, which by their brochure is for individuals who have quadriplegia, that means that they're paralyzed, or have ALS because they can't move muscles. And the concept is that they have this chip that's tiny that is implanted within the brain robotically. And it can lead to movements by your own thought. You don't talk, you don't say it. Wirelessly has this interface that will move the arm, move whatever 
based on your thought, not you saying it. And that, that to me is, as I'm saying this and looking at you, telling you, I'm like, my goodness, uh, it's incredible. And, and that's a game changer, but we don't know the details. And that's the part that's difficult because most trials of this uh, in the U.S., uh, there are two things that need to be done. One is the F has to be registered with the FDA. So we know that the FDA knows what's going on because they have the power to stop it if it's unsafe. The other thing, which is voluntary, something called clinicaltrials.gov, and that is a registry of all trials done in the United States. And in fact, if you want to publish it in a reputable medical journal, the journals require that the trial have been listed. You have to, yeah. It's not listed, not which could mean that um, they just want to do it with the FDA, or it could mean it's in another country. We've got a call, Mark from the West Side. Good morning, Mark. Welcome to First Coast Connect, and welcome to House Calls with Dr. Joe. Good morning. I'm a registered nurse. I've been one for 15 years now. And my question is, about five years ago, California and a couple other Western states held this big ref voter referendum that uh, mandated uh, hospitals have certain requirements of their nurses and caregivers uh, in their hospitals regarding to patients. Like you couldn't be one nurse and have 20 patients. You could only have, yeah, and they had certain acuity levels and things like that. And it was fought tooth and nail by you know, large hospitals over there, but it eventually passed, and that was four or five years ago. And I was just wondering if uh, has there been any studies done that you know about where it said that uh, you know, the patient outcomes uh, were better in their mm -hmm. hospitals over there than ours over here, or they were getting less you know, uh, hospital-acquired infections over there than here, you know, that kind of thing. I just wondered if you had, had there been any studies on that. Good question. Mark, that is a great question, and and we've covered facets of this because the California law is one of the first in the country to mandate a very specific patient nurse ratio in the hospital for the sake for the sake of safety, as you, as you pointed out, so that you don't have one nurse taking care of 25, 30 patients, and you have all these safety concerns and stuff like that. But it's the first law, and we don't know. I'm, I'm going to just speak uh, off on, online in terms of the studies itself. I don't know of the studies exactly that have kind of addressed what happens, but intuitively, I would assume, the smaller the ratio, the higher the care. Sure. Now, I'm, I'm sure that where, where the, all the big hospital players and insurance companies where they got nervous was because the moment you start... Uh, doing that, that means you have to increase your nursing pool, and um, there are shortages about. But and as, costs oh, it's go huge, up, sure, and right? then, so that's the key. But I would say that any any from my when I look at anything related to patient outcomes, uh, the lower the patient nurse ratio, the better for patient care, for two reasons. Number one, the nurse has the ability to care for their patient in the way they need to. And number two, you're not burning out that that individual, because that's what happens. They just want to, I mean, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, everyone, they just want to do their practice. Mm -hmm. But when the numbers and stuff like that goes crazy, it, it's not right. Uh, everyone's watching this California law. And I will say that, uh, curiously, uh, what I do know is that suddenly there's a lot of nurses that want to practice in California. Oh, yeah. I'm not surprised. Um, have you heard, this is just my own curiosity, about the, the nursing shortage um, forcing some providers to backfill those places with people that are maybe lower level um, trainees or not quite RNs, you know, that some of those duties would now be done by people who don't have that level of training? Yeah, that, that is probably something uh, they can't do like RN based work based on what RNs must be licensed to do. In other words, if, if the state or the federal government says you must have a nurse and the nurse can only do this, that's all they can do that the nurse can do. If it is not a nurse, they have to live within a scope of practice. But can they train them to do pieces of the work? Sure. And is there backfilling? I'd be a liar if I told you that there isn't. Uh, right. there, there, that's, that's how they survive, if you will, when there are these nursing shortages.
but you are, but there are these barriers, if you will, maybe not barriers, but just kind of fine lines of what scope of practice is. In other words, you can't do things that you're not licensed to do. So if you don't have a nursing license and a nurse is, is by law can do this, you can't just get someone off the street and do it. But you can train for those things that are not specified in that what what their scope of work is kind of around the it. margins that exactly. they can help out with mm-hmm. um we've got an email uh someone is asking what are some free health and mental health options for labor workers wow that's a great question i always kind of for places like that what i uh for those type of questions what i love to do is i like to send them uh to there are these great websites particularly run through the nih um, and um, and in this case, I would imagine for, for labor, uh, OSHA, which is uh, an organization that's devoted to occupational safety and health, these government websites, they are a treasure trove of information that have been carefully vetted. And oftentimes people don't know about these things, primarily because they don't get marketed. Uh, that uh, We don't have Gwyneth Paltrow uh, putting her name on, on any of these great uh, notes or anything along those lines or other celebrities. But that's where I would kind of direct you to, NIH, OSHA, uh, for things of that sort. And they oftentimes have areas where they cover everything from, uh, you know, how to take care of yourself or things of that sort. They're more explicit to job performance and disability things, but sometimes you'll find things of that sort. So I always uh, send folks to NIH. I send folks to CDC. I, that's where I start all my searches uh, when I'm looking for information like this, and that might help you as you look for it. Good advice. Um, so I want to return to the topic of these um, neuro implants. You bet. Because they're being used. I mean, they've been used to a certain extent. You know, people like Stephen Hawking, who was paralyzed, was able to speak. Um, they can stimulate the brains of Parkinson's patients. Um, it can help paralyzed patients move things. But there's now this discussion of something that's called cognitive liberty or neuro privacy or neuro rights. Describe what is at issue there and why there's some concerns. Well, now we have a technology, and and if we go back to this particular uh, device. Uh, remember that what is initiating the movement is that you are having a thought. So the question then becomes, uh, can you go down the road of actually reading a thought? Now, there are some very cool, real-world examples of they are, if you're able to do a thought for a movement, you can potentially unravel a thought of music, what an image memory and that now suddenly has this question of do i need to protect are those those are mine uh and like if you have a chip there well someone is going to be all that technology is going to be downloaded to some platform and who owns that i mean i think the first question people have is you know how would it be used in the workplace but i was surprised to see that it's actually being used in the workplace in terms of monitoring uh, long-haul truck drivers for uh, fatigue. This gets us to the whole thing of devices and element that can really monitor so many aspects of your health, from your heart rate to, as you said, fatigue, sleep. Anytime you do, I mean, I, I, I assume the good parts of the Apples, Googles, and, and things of the world. But on the other hand, they're sitting on a lot of data that that you're contributing to, that they're using in their technology to monetize for the next big app. And the question is privacy, who owns it, uh, those type of things. And those are very real issues. In the neuro privacy thing, they brought this up to yet one other step. Your thoughts, what what is running in your head, that is absolutely mind-blowing. So that's the type of stuff that we need to catch up with policy-wise, that that is covered by HIPAA. So what you're thinking is belongs to you, which I never thought that we would be talking about, but this is actually happening. Yeah. I mean, and in the clinical setting, you know, HIPAA does protect that privacy, right? So if you're my doctor and you're using that information, you wouldn't be able to Correct. repurpose it. But the question, when you have an Elon Musk doing a kind of secret, some semi-secret <laughs> trial, 
who would own that information? Who would have access? That and that's this is why it gets back to like you know why we we don't know all those details. And I want to point out we're not at that level where we can actually read someone's thought, but it just we're in the on the road on the highway that could kind of get to that direction. It reminds me of that uh, first Spider-Man movie with great power comes great responsibility. We just have to make sure that the responsibility part is taken care of. And so there is a push to kind of at least proactively, prophylactically come up with some rules. So I, I know there's a foundation, and I think that they're based up in uh, New York where they are looking to try to codify or create laws that basically say your thoughts belong to you. It sounds like almost so self-evident, but now with this technology, not so much. Well, Dr. Joe Servant, thank you so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. We're looking forward to this segment. Um, and you can listen to Dr. Joe's program, What's Health Got to Do With It, Saturdays at 4 p.m. or on demand at wjct.org. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Oh, it's a pleasure, Anne.